Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you all for coming to Open Source for Newbies, uh, attracting and retaining talented people for your project. Uh, just a really quick show of hands. Are there any folks in the audience who would identify themselves as complete newbies or newbies? One. Excellent. <laughs> for those of you who feel like uh, the guide for the experienced contributor trying to bring more people into the project isn't the best talk for you, uh, we are reprising this talk for a newbie audience at Open Day. So please feel free to come along to that and also bring your friends. And if you see both, whoa, if you see both talks, um, you'll see similarities and parallels. My name is Leslie Hawthorne. I'm a program manager for Google's Open Source Programs Office, where I focus on programs to get students involved in open source projects, specifically the Google Summer of Code program and its high school uh, pre-university sister, the Highly Open Participation Contest. And I'm Kat Allman. I've been with Google about two and a half years. Before that, I was with Usenix. And before that, I was with SendMail. I work with Leslie on open source outreach programs. Um, and it's been my pleasure to give this talk with Leslie for a while now. And hopefully, you will learn as much from listening to her as I have. <laughs> We've been giving this talk for about a year. Our first actual uh, instance of this was at the SCALE conference in March of last year. And it's actually been incredibly valuable to us uh, to hear from our audiences about uh, problems that newbies have, obstacles that they face. So we really do welcome your feedback to improve this presentation because we want it to be a living document that's useful to the entire community. And this is where we throw in the necessary legal disclaimer. While we both do work for Google, these cool. opinions are our own based on our own experience. And your mileage may vary. So again, we want to know when your mileage is variable. So. Let's assume it sounds like you're all involved in a project already. So why would you want to have new contributors, aside from the whole sleep, working for a living, and maybe love life, personal hygiene? <laughs> personal hygiene? I don't want any. Uh, so obviously, gaining new contributors has its benefits. As Kat was mentioning, we're all busy people. Uh, we all have a lot to do. We all work very hard. And the more people that there are on your project, the less work, potentially, that you will have to do or the opportunity will come for you to work, move on to something that you think is a bit more exciting and challenging if you've been maintaining a particular part of your project for a really long time. And there's always the think about tomorrow aspect. You get to know new people, and people go on and get jobs, and someday you might need a new job yourself. And now you know a wider school of people who might be able to point you in the right direction, recommend you, et cetera. And last but not least, um, it's uh, a great way to, to sort of share the way you think and share your value system and to really feel good about what you're doing. Um, I don't know how many of you folks are subscribed to any of the mailing lists for the Free Software Foundation, but an appeal went out this morning to uh, folks to join the Free Software Foundation from Benjamin Mako Hill, who gave the keynote, I believe, yesterday. And one of his points was that fr free as in freedom for software isn't really about software. It's about giving users freedom in their daily lives. And for me, that's why I'm passionate about open source and being involved in this community, because I really think it is about empowering people. And by mentoring and bringing newbies into your community, you're getting the opportunity to empower them. And this is my favorite slide. I'm going to leap on a soapbox here. Once upon a time, the power of the press, the controlling of information, and the technology of the day belonged only to those people who, well, back at that point, had the money to hire monks to copy down their um, manual before it could be read. Basically, the power of the press belongs to those who own the press. Open source gives us all the opportunity to not only own the press, but to create new ones and spread information as widely as possible with as little, um, what's that called, friction as possible. Plus, there is, I know a lot of people in this community are really interested in craft. And I'm going to show my age and say I am attracted to it from the whole punk rock sensibility of, you know, if you want to make music, go and start a band. The fact that you can't actually play an instrument shouldn't really be an impediment to this, <laughs> <laughs> arguably. So open source is this tremendous playground filled with interesting people and new ideas. And I would hope each of you would bring this kind of curiosity and enthusiasm to your project as well as your life elsewhere. So.
where do we get started? So first and foremost, as you're thinking about bringing newbies into your project, please understand that they probably think you're that guy. Yeah. Whether you are or not. And it might be nice for you to, to let them maintain that illusion for a little bit. But wait, there's more. <laughs> I, we, at one point, were giving this talk at BSD Canada, and I said, you know, think of it in terms of the intimidation factor. If you found yourself sitting next to this guy on an airplane, would you argue the theory of relativity with him? And of course, there's always one guy in the audience. One guy raised his hand in the back and said, well, actually, he was my tutor at Cambridge, and so, yeah, I'd argue with him. But <laughs> yeah, what are you we doing hate him. <laughs> but remember that um, while, yes, this is your opportunity to be a godhead, that it's in your best interest not to uh, hurl too many thunderbolts. And also, just recall, if you, you know, if you think about it from the perspective of the folks that you're teaching, if they really do think you're that guy, don't be that guy. Be willing to show that you two are human. Be willing to show your mistakes. Be willing to be down to earth in your communications and, and really have that empathy to realize that people are scared to make mistakes in front of their friends, let alone someone they think is judging their capacity to join a new community, join a new project. So far, no. Well, are you asking who is that guy? <laughs> really? You're kidding. Uh, okay. Like we wow. said, one in every audience. <laughs> Absolutely. So there are many different kinds of contributions that can be made. Um, who was it earlier, Matthew Garrett? Yeah, Matthew Garrett's presentation yesterday on, on joining the Linux community, he really focused on, on a great point, which was we can't only value code contributions. Being a part of a community is anyone who turns up and who actually cares. And focusing solely on the importance of code eliminates the opportunity for enthusiasm and potential from a whole lot of people and leaves other parts of your project neglected and not getting the love that they need. Parts like? Well, things like um, localization, certainly a big deal. The days when computer science, IT technology was conducted exclusively in English are far behind us and fading away in the distance. Making your documentation, your code comments, hack your wiki available to people who speak different languages or are differently abled automatically, dramatically increases your pool of contributors and potentially users of your software. Um, documentation is also very handy that way. Uh, I think in the past, some projects have deliberately not documented things because the, either they didn't want the overhead of newbies or they liked having a secret society and it was kind of like if you weren't, if you didn't already know what was going on, they didn't want you to come and get involved. I think increasingly people realize that that's not a productive attitude. And so having documentation helps broaden your audience. And I think I'm doing this wrong. So uh, my, my I like on. Uh, and my favorite point to make here is uh, for those of us who may have heard and or even said at one point or another, uh, yeah, the code is the documentation, read the comments. Not so much. <laughs> this does not help us. Well, some comments are more helpful than others, but I'm sure all of us have seen comments that were less than helpful. Oh, actually, can we go back oh, for just one second? Back? Good. And one last quick point that I wanted to make is um, actually one of the functions in the community that I think uh, gets less recognition because there's no easy way to codify it is actual user support. There are folks who hang out in IRC channels and do nothing but answer newbie questions, do nothing but point people in the right direction, and do nothing but know where everything is so that when someone, when someone has a problem to solve, thank you, Ms. <laughs> Donna, they can point them to that problem. And that is a huge, huge place where newbies can be helpful because they're answering the questions that they themselves just had. And how much time does it save you if you're a busy developer to not answer the same question over and over again? Mm -hmm. And people that do those kinds of human factor assistance, um, how shall I put this gracefully, don't make that a place to stick people you don't think are actually that productive because it is an important function and it does make a difference. 
So treat people that do, if you will, the soft stuff with the same respect that you would treat somebody that's contributing uh, patches because they are contributing even though they're maybe not as technical as other people. Let's go. Okay. And then we get to the really mushy stuff, marketing. How many of you are cowering in fear at the use of the word marketing? <laughs> oh, good. <clears throat> we are people. here to have an intervention. It will be okay. <laughs> yeah. One thing, when we first started putting this deck together, Leslie brought up fan art. And I was kind of like, hmm, I don't know about that. But then we hosted the KDE, um, which release was that? The KDE release party for their 4.0 release. It was pretty groovy. And this couple turned up, and they had, this is going to sound creepy, but they had made full-body furry suits of the KDE dragon and the dragon lady. And really I mean, cool. these are the... <laughs> it, you know, you'd think it was creepy, but they also brought some wine, so we all had a big moment of happy. And, you know, there they were with the core developers and various members of the press, and everybody got all giddy and had to have their picture taken with the giant dragons. So it really made a difference to the overall tone and happy vibe of the event. Things like that really make a difference. Um, you may have heard Google has a new OS that's kind of a, I'm going to probably mangle this, but it's sort of a mashup between Perl and C++. You mean the Go programming language? The Go programming yeah. language. It's pretty darn technical. But Rob Pike's spouse is an amazing underground cartoonist, and she did this really cute gopher, the Go gopher. Because it's very, very clever. Because it's very, very clever. But what's wacky is they started getting new contributors and people volunteering their 20% time at Google to work on this project because they wanted a t-shirt with that darn cute gopher on it. So never underestimate the power of an adorable t-shirt. So how many of you folks actually enjoy spending lots of time on uh, Identica or its closed source version Twitter? Okay, only a couple of you. Believe it or not, there are an awful lot of people out there in the world who think that all of this wonderful, you know, social networking, microblogging, Facebooking, whatnot, not, 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 is actually pretty cool. That may not be you, and that's okay. But recognize that this is an incredibly powerful outreach tool. Um, I actually use Identica to take notes from conference sessions, just so that I can go back and look at it later, but also so that other people can get the benefit of the sessions that they're not in. And just seeing where my notices are retweeted or other people are reading all over the world and knowing that those people are either getting more enthusiastic about open source in general or getting more enthusiastic about the community that I run, the Summer of Code program, is pretty powerful. And then fundraising. Um, I'm willing to bet that virtually no one in this room likes calling up strangers and asking them for money. Anybody want to disagree with me? Wow, we got one where no one wanted to agree. <laughs> but. Fundraising, yes, it's open source, but we still need disk space, internet access, um, scholarships to come to great community events like LCA. There is a place for people who are interested in supporting the community by going out and supporting the community or finding other people, um, like the Google Open Source Programs Office, for example, to uh, provide financial support. And actually, e even though fundraising sounds like a, a fairly thankless task and a scary, scary proposition, um, there's actually a lot of really cool, fun ways that you can think to do it. And, you know, this is where uh, the opportunity exists to go find someone who you know who may know nothing about code but is just really creative. And suddenly they come up with inspiration for a great contest that raises you a couple thousand dollars and get several of your contributors sent to your key developers conference, which has happened. And I think Leslie is the one that really should address the question of community management. Sometimes your community needs somebody to wrangle people so that you can write code and you don't have to talk to the lawyers and you don't have to worry about getting the checks cut and you don't have to do any of those other things that you don't want to do because they're less fun. Postage. So there you go. We can take care of this problem and your community managers can take care of this problem and I guarantee you that your community managers don't have to be coders because shown here actual size, we're not. So, oops, speak in the microphone, that's the first thing. Um, how to position your project so that you get the maximum possible pool of appropriate contributors? So make sure that you clearly upfront define your project's goals and also your non-goals. 
That way when people come to approach you because they're excited about the idea of working with you, they know that this is the right place for them. And you've already weeded out uh, folks who are not quite where you're at or what you're about. My favorite story, do you mind, along these lines is the Subversion Project. So they decided, uh, the Subversion Revision Control System, they decided that the, when they started out that their mission was to be a compelling replacement for CVS. They documented this on their website, life was good. A couple of months later, some dude turned up on their mailing list and was quite strident in insisting that they should just toss this whole subversion business right out the window and fix CVS. And they pointed him back to the mission statement saying they would like to replace CVS. But, 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 point back to mission statement. But, 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 eventually he went away and that might have been good for all concerned. But the fact is you want to be really explicit about what your expectations are so that people can meet them. And that includes if you have um, social or political underpinnings behind your project. Um, put those out there. Um, Leslie's very involved with the Humanitarian FOSS project. They're very explicit about they want to generate free and open source software to support humanitarian programs. And you'll actually, I think, find that you're able to attract a wider pool of contributors when you articulate those kinds of social or political concerns, even if that's not the overt purpose of your project. So, for example, there was a huge surge in the number of people both using and contributing to Drupal after they did a, a marketing, have we intervened enough yet, a marketing campaign <laughs> to show everyone that Howard Dean, a, a, a particular U.S. presidential candidate, was using Drupal for his website. And moving on, creating a community that your contributors are going to find comfortable. Communities like any other group of people have a personality. Any aggregate of beings comes together and influences how each other behaves. You might want to stop and think what kind of group of people you want to be. Some communities, um, gaming communities in many cases, thrive on being very aggro. They're, uh, they live on IRC and they're pretty hostile, take no prisoners, you know, no beating around the bush. Um, other communities are equally aggressive at being sensitive to one another's feelings, um, having profound care about not stepping on each other's feet, not being hierarchical, uh, being polite. Frankly, while I prefer something more towards the latter and less towards the former, it's okay to say, all right, I want to be able to be um, a hyper-aggressive, expletive-centric member of a community that supports that. Know that about yourself. Put that out there so that if somebody gets involved a week later and gets wildly flamed, at least they won't be surprised. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I think, um, you know, if you look at some of the uh, project mailing lists, like the kernel mailing list is well known for being a bastion of flame fast anger. You're an idiot. You're a moron. Expletive deleted, expletive deleted. And while, you know, the folks in, who are already a part of the community know that, for people just coming in, it is a miserable experience that makes you never want to come back again. Mm -hmm. So again, if that's the way you all work well together, may not be the way that we work well together, that's fine. Just make sure you're out there about it. And if someone comes in and says, why are you acting this way? The appropriate response is not to tell them to fisk off. The appropriate response is to tell them, that's the way we do things. Here's a little bit about our community tone over here in this document. Um, this is not personal, this is just how we roll. That said, the idea of having a code of conduct where you essentially define the edges of appropriate behavior is, again, a good thing, in part because um, most people here have probably heard uh, Ben and Fitz's poisonous people talk. I'm sure we've all had people try and integrate themselves in the community who were a big old waste of oxygen. Having a code of conduct written down gives you a codus to say, hey, hey, that isn't cool. Here's why. You know that. One warning. Otherwise, please take your code and go away. And, or, thank you. And, and one thing that I do want to make very, very clear, you know, we, we have said if you want to be part of a community that's a little bit more um, aggressive in its communication, that's okay. Um, I want to make it very clear that we are not saying that it is okay to be discriminatory 
or abusive to anyone. If you see behavior in, a commu in your community where someone is being uh, openly aggressive and hostile and talking about people's body parts or people's sexual orientation or people's race or gender or anything of that nature, your community has a problem that you need to solve immediately because that's not just about getting new contributors into your community. It's about this community overall. I think the thing that binds us together is we are about freedom and empowering people, and that is the exact opposite of that goal. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, to put a self-interested spin on it, if you're here to get new contributors or to learn how to get new contributors, please remember that the more extreme your community standards, the lower your pool of potential contributors is and a more aggressive, um, pardon the expression, old school approach to internet dialogue is very off-putting to um, populations outside of the traditional computer science mainstream. If you want to increase the geographic and other X spread of people available to your project, you might really want to think about how those communities relate to one another and consider, mir consider mirroring that behavior in how your project communicates. And last but not least, we've talked a lot about you know, good things to do, best practices here. Beware of project creep. Beware of trying to be all things to all people. Know what you're good at. Focus on what you're good at. And as you're bringing new people in, have them focus there and your core principles, what you're good at, because uh, you know, if you try and just be like, we're going to be a great home for people to learn about open source and free software, so everyone should come down and hang out with us, and oh, well, yes, we're a Python project, and you don't know Python, but that's okay, we'll teach you. Focus on what you're good at, the right people will come to you. So now what? I don't know, now what? Ah, provide useful guidance, that's now what. <clears throat> um, this seems like a big old duh, but it's very easy when you're busy working ahead, working off the bug list, et cetera, to let your website, wiki, what have you, get a little tired around the edges, AKA completely out of date. Uh, new people need to understand what's going on and they're gonna figure out what's going on because of what you tell them. So please do keep stuff get up to date, fresh, on topic. And it's incredibly useful to provide a getting started guide or documentation that is specifically for new contributors. And the best part is, this is actually fairly painless because as you get new contributors, you make one of their first tasks to be to write the getting started guide because they knew what sucked and what they didn't know and what they had to ask you. Get them to write the getting started guide. Yes. And there are these really cool things on the internet called links. What is link? It's amazing how many times you go to a website and there's no way easily accessible through a nav bar, whatever, to figure out what's available on the website. Now you could say, hey, search. Have you ever noticed how many websites don't actually have a search box integrated? Oh, really? Oh, so well. Mia culpa. I think we should. I think we should take that back to HQ as a as a serious issue. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh well, gosh, we'll get right on that when we get home. So, okay. <laughs> so the other thing too that um, I would like to point out to folks as being very very important is, if you are trying to get people to contribute to your project, please make things obvious like where to find your source code. I kid you not. One of my litmus tests for participating in Google Summer of Code, we have hundreds of projects apply every year, upwards of 400. Um, and you, I go to their homepage and my first test, can I find a link to download your source code in a minute? Really, I give you about 30 seconds because I have a short attention span. If I can't find it in 30 seconds, mm -mm, your project is not accessible. If people can't figure out where to find your code and you want them to help you with code, that's a problem. And what, the, oh, and that one's terrible. Yeah. Please, please, please document your license explicitly. I shouldn't have to go through four sub menus and click on maybe it's documentation, maybe it's source, maybe it's blah, maybe it's blah. Put it somewhere obvious, like under a little tab that says license. Oh. Thank you, Donna. Excellent point. And if you have a preferred um, tool, well, preferred, if in order to work on your project you have to have X skill, don't be shy about telling people, in order to work on our project, you must know Python or whatever. Um, 
don't make people hunt around and find out only after they've submitted something that it's totally in opposition to the way you want things done on your project. And uh, major bonus points for actually pointing to resources to learn the skills required to help contribute to your project. Wacky. So getting started finding newbies is actually easier than it sounds. Um, some people will just come to you, and uh, those people who just come to you are the people who are already kind of like you because that's how they found you. So how do you find people who aren't already a lot like those around you so you get that new blood, you get that new perspective? That actually loops back to marketing. When I worked at Usenix, I had to argue with some of the old timers who said, marketing's bleh. You know, anybody who would be right to be part of us already knows about us. Now, aside, <laughs> aside from the whole wildly illogical recursive aspects of that statement, don't think of it as pandering to people or trying to trick them or wasting your time. Think of it as if you value your project, you want to make it easy for other people to see why they would value your project too. So one thing that I think is an incredibly important part of bringing newbies into your project is actually your issue tracker. Um, some people actually go so far as to put absolutely everything in their issue tracker from we need new documentation on this topic. This documentation needs to be updated all the way along down to, you know, we need a new logo. Um, in addition to coding bugs, um, you may or may not want to do that. But one thing that has been incredibly profoundly useful for a bunch of folks that I know is actually tagging stuff in their issue tracker as easy or getting started or newbie bug. Um, the GNOME folks, for example, have GNOME love bugs. So if you love GNOME, but you don't know what to do, grab a GNOME love bug and start working on that. And these are easy tasks that get people familiar with doing certain kinds of work in the code base. And then people get a sense of an immediate accomplishment because they do something that requires work but wasn't rocket science and didn't require them to understand five years worth of arcane, oh my god, I don't even know how that part works and stuff. If you have access to a teenager, either a, uh, a sibling, godchild, neighbor, whatever, um, sit them down, have them read through your website, and if they come away going, or um, basically think in terms of making your online presence a welcoming one to the kind of people you want. So how do you know when you're busy trying to spend time on new contributors, how do you know who to spend time on? Because we have all been in the situation where Someone comes along full of enthusiasm, less full of clue, and that's okay, because all of us lacked clue at one point, and yet they continue to be really, really enthusiastic, and then they never really do anything. And you kind of feel bad, right? You're like, wow, I wasted two hours trying to talk so-and-so in order to be able to fix this bug. Ouch. How do you recognize people who are actually going to follow through and get work done so that you can spend your precious time helping out those who will hopefully bear fruit? Um, we'll have a... Um a pretty discouraging slide about this later, but we'll talk about the positive points here. Um, good potential contributors are ones who, big da, volunteer to help. Even better, they don't just have fabulous ideas about why your project should be done differently. No, they have actual useful suggestions that are on topic. And if they actually do some work, that's extra good. And also, don't underestimate the value of submitting a bug report and submitting a bug report properly and teaching someone actually how to do that. There are tons of FAQs on the net about how to write a good bug report. If your project has particular nuances, take the time to document those. Um, as my friend Joshua Gay puts it, it's actually work for someone to tell you that something sucks because they could have just gone away and never talked to you again. So, you know, if, if folks come along and they do file bug reports, one, good for them. Two, encourage them to do it. And three, if that's the only contribution from them you ever see, it's still an incredibly valuable contribution. So here are some basics. Um, you're welcome to link these from your site if you think it would be good. I know that I have been doing this for long enough that I forget once upon a time I didn't know how to behave on a mailing list. Um, but I would also argue that some people who've been doing it for a long time still don't know how to behave on a mailing list. So there are some basics here that we all might stand to refresh ourselves with. So, and, and the key here takeaway that I think with this slide is to, is to set a good example, um, and particularly around mailing list etiquette, newbies really suffer disproportionately from being told that they're 
behavior on a mailing list is not what it ought to be, and they get sometimes some pretty vituperative responses about that. And uh, my favorite thing to do, um, since there, you know, some of the mailing lists I'm on have more than like 8,000 people subscribed, someone will ask an RTFM question, and usually someone will immediately jump to tell them RTFM, which stinks. So I usually respond back with, you know, here, here's a link to the FAQ, here's the relevant text, and I know you did not know this, because if you did, you probably wouldn't have done this, but it's considered inappropriate to send a message to a mailing list with upwards of 7,000 subscribers when if you had, uh, you know, when you could have read something or you could have emailed someone off list, like the list owner for this question, because, you know, 7,000 people don't need to get this message, really only I do, or really only a couple of people do. And immediately you see a behavior change. And you not only see a behavior change in that new contributor, you see a behavior change in the kind of people who, you know, start flaming folks who just don't know any different or they wouldn't have done it that way. Communication annoyances. This goes back to the style of your community. Some communities live and die on IRC. Being old school, I'm a fan of email and mailing lists. Um, I'm sure other people are out there coming up with the transdermal implants that do straight to brainwave, and that's going to be the wave of the future, but I'll never get it. My point being that figure out what your preferred style of communication is going to be, and then don't do dumb stuff, such as? Uh, you know, overusing capital letters, making overuse of acronyms. If you see people doing these kinds of things, too, these are potential warning signs. There, there are folks who, again, the, the great anonymity of being online. If you notice that someone uses one nickname in IRC, one nickname via email, and then when you chat with them uh, by, I don't know, whatever chat client is your preferred way to communicate that's not IRC, and they have yet another name, maybe they're okay, maybe they have issues. Something worth keeping an eye out on. And remember, too, your IRC nickname is going to be easily discoverable. And so if one of your reasons for love open office. Um, a lot. <laughs> if one of your reasons for getting online and getting involved in a project is to develop your professional technology background, choosing a nickname like Stud Muffin McMaster. Mr. Deviant Dude, actual nickname. Yeah. Um, unless you're interested in developing a burgeoning career in adult entertainment, you might want to keep the pithy nicknames to yourself. All right. Ah, hazing is unproductive. Who here has gotten a nasty gram in the mail based on some question that you asked at one point in your life? Ms. Donna. Okay, a few hands creeping up here and there. It's very easy to send a message, hit send, and go on with your life, particularly in the heat of anger. Um, I think in a more social context, it's referred to as drunk dialing. Mm -hmm. But don't, um, do that <laughs> don't do that either. Yeah. But stop and think. Um, if when you started out in computers, people were really mean to you and verbally abusive and nasty and non-helpful, don't see that as a model to perpetuate, but rather see it as something not to do. And, and we're not suggesting, I mean, open source is very much a blunt world, right? But you, get, you get a patch in and your entire purpose behind reviewing a patch is to tell someone what is wrong. That doesn't mean, you know, you don't want to, to pull your punches and not tell them what the errors are, but at the same time you don't want to get to the end and read, well, that was a very good first attempt if you were a, you know, slightly deformed gopher uh, backpedaling down a stream. And by the way, please don't come back. Okay, thanks, bye. Like, that does not help anyone. Don't do it. Yeah. Matthew Garrett yesterday was talking about uh, uh, harsh profanity on mailing lists, and he used a euphemism, which I can't repeat on tape, but... Uh, <laughs> star, 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 <laughs> my star, star, star. <laughs> yeah. Actually, there were four stars in each instance. Spell it yourself. But um, we're not going to do profanity jeopardy here. That will be later after uh, the talk. Of fortune, sorry. Um, but then he followed on with the next slide showing that it was an actual quote of something that he had written himself some years ago. Um, 
we're all human, we all fly off the handle, but it's a good idea to try not to because it'll come back and bite you in the star, star, star. Uh -huh. So here we are talking about getting more contributors, getting more contributors. We have five minutes, so we'd better get on this. We are going faster now. Okay. Um, you don't necessarily want everybody who turns up and wants to help. So um, really quickly, I have something that I call the rule of three. If someone comes and asks me a question that they could have looked up, I answer politely and point them in the right direction and actually paste the relevant detail. The second time, I send them a link. The third time, if they're still asking a question, I let them know that I really want to help them. Unfortunately, I don't have time right now. I think they can find their answer by searching. And if you get somebody who's a little bit rude with you about that, it also helps to point out they can find the answer by searching using only words in their email to you. <laughs> Has happened. Um, and then there's the angry people. The world is filled with angry people. You don't want your project filled with those angry people because they make one angry. Uh, my personal favorite is the people who write into Summer of Code demanding details and other members of the community say, read the fact, read the threads, and they're like, oh, that'll take too much time, just tell me. Uh, no. Yeah. Let's see, failing to accept criticism well, um, the people who just want to find a place to pick a fight clearly need to go away. Um, at some point, suck up your courage and tell people, look, this isn't working out. You need to go someplace else. Mm -hmm. So aside from all the difficulties and all the myriad ways you can put your feet wrong, actually, as we all know, the world of open source is filled with kind, awesome people. Like these people, all of our Summer of Code mentors and, you know, you know all of you, really, because you're awesome. Yeah. And we know like half of you. And the other half of you we should get to know over the next yeah. couple days. There's actually some uh, Kiwis and Aussies in this picture from a Summer of Code mentor summit. I suppose pointing at the screen isn't really going to help anybody, is it? No, They really not. are <laughs> in there. Your friends are in this photo. Yeah, look for your friends in the photo. So, in summary, everyone was new once. Share your enthusiasm, share your knowledge. That enthusiasm is, a, is infectious. Yes. Remember how much you know. Uh, it's very easy to forget stuff you know. It's just so second nature. For example, if you see a string of letters and there's an at sign somewhere in there, you know it's an email address. But not everybody does. That's an actual example from my personal life. We will totally talk about that during the questions. Yes. And enjoy. Because we're all here to have fun and get good stuff done. Yes. Some resources. Um, most of these are probably familiar to everyone in the audience, so I will go through them quickly. But this last one is fresh and new and shiny and exciting. So uh, during the last uh, Summer of Code Mentor Summit, when we invite several of the folks who've actually helped to tutor our students, uh, to visit Mountain View and hang out and hack for the weekend and get to know each other. Um, and if you want to know what that's like, you ask Sam at the back in the cool Kiwi Foo shirt. Um, and we did a documentation sprint. So in three days, we hacked together the How To Mentor for Summer of Code Guide. It is available under a Creative Commons license. You are welcome and encouraged to improve it and change it. And it is my completely not secret hope that folks will find their uh, themselves pulled in thinking this is valuable documentation and adapt it to generic mentoring for open source communities as opposed to being uh, a document that's focused on some specifics for the Summer of Code program. And it's a living document. If you have good ideas, please throw them on in there. Thank you all for coming. Any questions? Uh, yeah, thanks for the talk. I was um, on the communication style thing that was really helpful. Uh, one of the things in that area I've noticed is a lot of IRC projects that do a lot of IRC stuff often tend to suffer from being quite heavily time zone oriented. And when you're in this part of the world, that, that can really stink. Uh, also, sometimes people say summer when they mean winter and all this sort of stuff. But um, do you have any ideas for how to handle that if you're a project and you're based in Europe or the States and you want to? bring in Aussies or vice versa, and Kiwis. 
So I think that the real answer there is, as much as people like to talk to each other real time, and, and that's important, I think that there's a couple ways to do it. One, projects inevitably have to have meetings um, from time to time. Maybe your project has a weekly meeting, maybe it's monthly, maybe you're meeting about a particular release. Have that meeting at a time that is inconvenient for most of the contributors, seriously. Um, and those who are the ones who are most active in the project, if you're really focused on getting new people into the project, that's a sacrifice that you need to make. Uh, because if you're missing out on great talented folks because they happen to be offset from you by you know, 12 hours, that sucks, don't do it. The other thing is, fo you know, most open source projects that I know live and die by IRC. I think that's great for solving problems real time. Make your development discussions happen on your mailing list because no one's gonna read through a chat log where Oh look, it's the coolest new lolcat, and you know, da, 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 and you know, 20 minutes through, you're actually talking about a technical point. Um, although I too like lolcats. So, uh, and if you are one of those folks who is in a project where you live and die by your IRC chats, and you've just had an important discussion, take it upon yourself to send a summary of that discussion to the mailing list and link to the IRC log so that folks can read it. Because otherwise, people who come along and are trying to get more data are going to have no idea where to go or even that there is data to get. Yes, Ms. Donna. And then Ms. Leslie. Yep. Um, one of the challenges I've found now leading the Linux users of Victoria mailing list is that um, attitude to newbies is not great in that community. How do you actually... I actually really liked your three steps. Of, you know, you get a question that res the answer is... RTFM, but take that three-step approach. Um, more, give me more on that, you know, reversing a culture which has clearly gone bad, but paying attention to the fact that, hey, maybe this culture wants to be that way. Um, the way I like to do it, because I do interact with a bunch of younger people, mostly men, who are in college and who are really smart and want the whole world to know how smart they are by answering, you know, this is a stupid question. Because, folks, that really shows how smart you are. Just so you know, um, I ignore rude responses. Like, they didn't even exist. I don't reply to those replies. I reply to the original question, which is a tacit way of saying your response does not matter because it was inappropriate. Um, and the other thing that I do is if there are positive responses in the thread, maybe they're not quite the right response, but there are positively oriented responses, I start off my response by thanking that person for their helpful suggestion. So positive reinforcement. The other one that I've been struggling with is uh, I tend to ignore the most of the conversation, but every now and again someone comes in and goes, Mom, he was mean to me. And I tell them, guys, you're grown-ups. Don't ask me to adjudicate. And then I get even more crap. So that's been a challenge for me as a community leader. Um, I think it, so. When I've had the mom moment a couple times. Um, do you want to say anything about the mom moment, or shall I pontificate? Shouting doesn't work. Um, some friends of ours are putting together a uh, technology user group in Kiev, and apparently there are two separate groups that have formed, and they each insist that they are the only legitimate Kiev technology user group, and those other guys, you should make them stop. Um, I don't think it's a solvable problem. Um, the friend in question is like, you know, whoever ends up actually doing something is going to coalesce a community and the other people will probably go away. If they both manage to actually get something done, they can be mean to each other at brunch and in the meantime, work is getting done. And really quickly um, on adjudicating, don't take sides. Focus on the specific goal that everyone's trying to achieve, and I will go into subtle nuance on that afterwards. Miss Leslie, yes. In 25 words or less, um, do you have any quick words of advice for somebody who is contemplating leaping into this contributing to open source projects space? Um, when you feel the madness coming, dive, dive, dive. <laughs> no, um, I would actually say, given the talk that I saw yesterday, go check out the Dream With project. They really have their stuff together for bringing in new contributors and they have really thought about doing that so that's a great place to get started and the other thing is have fun do something that you love and the rest will follow and come to our talk on saturday at open day for more specifics 
Talk at open day on Saturday. More specifics is good. Are we shutting up? Yeah. I think we are. Yes, we are definitely are. You'd like to put your hands together and thank our presenters? And a bottle of wine. Great. Thank you, everyone.